After nearly 50 years of military rule and isolation, Myanmar, formerly known as Burma, is a land where time has almost stood still. Since 2011, however, the country has begun to open up and introduce reforms. It is changing rapidly. Between the Indian subcontinent and Southeast Asia lies the country of Myanmar. Its life and character has been shaped by the Irrawaddy River. Over 2,000 kilometers long, it is the central transport route and connects the historic locations. In the north of the country, the Iowadi is heavily traveled by cargo and passenger ships. Many of them date from the colonial era. The Hantawadi has traveled the river for almost 70 years. And Ula Shwe is her captain. The ferry boat is approaching the final stop for all the large boats, the town of Bamor. Even during the time of the British colonial rule, Bamor was the last outpost in northern Myanmar. The market is lively and its population multi-ethnic. The border to China is only 35 kilometers away. The roads are in terrible condition, unsafe and often impassable. Thus, goods come to the city by boat or are smuggled from nearby China. It is late afternoon and Captain Ula Shui enjoys a cup of coffee. Towards evening, the port of Bamor quietens down quickly. But with the first rays of the morning sun, the river port awakens. Lined with jetties and landing piers, it is a lively hub of trade and commercial activity. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required.
the Hantawadi is also being loaded for her return trip. When she's ready to depart, the captain boards. And off she goes, this time downstream. The Ayawadi is wide, sometimes even several kilometers, but it is not deep. It carries enormous amounts of sediment from the mountains, so its navigable channel changes constantly. Then the Ayawadi passes through a rocky chain of hills. Myanmar is a Buddhist country, and the river is lined with countless golden stupas, pagodas, and monasteries. The monastery Letsau Khan lies in the middle of the second gorge. It houses six monks, and U Nimata is the abbot. ဥစီနိုခုတာနာပြုတဲ့နေရာမှာဒီတဘဝအခြေခံမှာပထမဆုံးလုပ်ကတာပါလေဒီအဲ့ဒီမြစ်ကတန်ရှင်းမှုန
Domesticated elephants are a tradition in Asia. Each animal has its personal trainer and rider. In Myanmar, they are called Uzi. Aung Ko Win is 12 years old and an Uzi in training. He will grow up together with his young elephant. He will work with and be bound to the elephant his entire life. The Uzi alone and no one else leads and trains his elephant. And even when bathing in the river, which elephants love above all else, the Uzi and his elephant are inseparable. An elephant has a lot to learn. It must be able to understand and follow 24 different commands. Finished with their bath, the animals are now waiting for Dr. Miao Manu, the veterinarian. <laughs> Only after 15 years does an elephant start working in the jungle. It takes a long time for the animal to get used to carrying people and loads and following the commands of its Uzi. Finally, it is time to go to work. The elephants work in the jungle forest, where they transport valuable teakwood trunks. The tropical rainforest is the greatest treasure of the country. But 40% of the forest has already been cut down. Wood is loaded, legally and illegally, everywhere along the river. Teakwood trunks are heavier than water, so traditionally they are rafted downriver with outrigger boats. The winter, when pleasant weather is the rule, is the season of temple celebrations. The people go on pilgrimages to holy places, such as the river island near the town of Shuegu.
here, hundreds of stupas house relics of veneration. Nothing shapes the everyday life of the people as much as the Theravada Buddhism, which reached the area in the 3rd century BC. Good deeds, donations or pilgrimages facilitate a rebirth into a better life. Particularly constructive is the donation of a pagoda or the gilding of an existing one. And the gold of the pagodas comes from the river. Since time immemorial, gold has been mined along its shores. In areas where the river sediment contains a lot of gold, mining is conducted on a large scale. All the workers are young, as no one can take the back-breaking work for a long time. This mine near Shweigu has 20 claims and thus 20 mining teams. A single team consists of eight people. Don't Women also work the claims. Ten hours a day amidst the deafening noise of the pumps, barefoot in cold water. ไอ้หลุมโยมาเต็มมาไทยประชาเนี่ยมาสรอแอบโยงโอ้ไอ้หลุมโยจอกเกะจีซุ่มมาซุโลเลยไอ้ไอ้หลุมโยสรอไทย
towards evening, the government ferry approaches the small town of Kata, located on the upper reaches of the Ayawadi. For the passengers and Captain Ulushwe, a long journey is coming to an end. Tomorrow, however, the captain will go back upstream to Bamor. In the early morning, the monks walk through the streets of Qatar. They accept everything that people put into their bowls and without a word of thanks. It is those who give who are grateful that they can do a good deed and so gain good karma. With the monks' daily collecting of arms, the town of Qatar wakes up. The town had its heyday during the colonial time, when the English controlled the whole north of the country from here. They brought engineers, soldiers and administrators from British India, including the grandfather of Mario Tenai. In Upper Burma, Kata is the largest town. The river and railway and land roads are here. So they, they keep the Justice officers and other central jail all here. He is over 80 years old, but Mario still remembers the colonial times. The British writer George Orwell was stationed in Qatar as a police officer. In his novel Burmese Days, he depicts the elitism and arrogance of the British. For example, at the British club, where only British nationals were allowed to enter. The building still stands today, and the tennis court is still playable. George Orwell's house also still exists. This is where he decided to leave the military and begin writing. It was here that he came to hate imperialism. Tintin Eye produces a speciality for which the town is known across the entire country. Her business is dependent on the river or rather on a tiny fish called napier, which is endemic to the Ayawadi and thrives particularly well around Qatar. The fish are processed in Tintinai's house. <laughs> The mixture ferments a little and has a long shelf life. It tastes somewhat sour and can be eaten either cold or fried. Tintinai offers it in various sizes, ranging from 500 gram packets to 70 kilo baskets. It's early in the morning, around 5 a.m., and the speedboat is being loaded for the trip to the city of Mandalay. The boat, named Silver Moon, belongs to 27-year-old Winwaso. 
Before each boat trip, Win Wah So reads Buddhist verses. When her father died three years ago, she had to take over the business. For a number of years now, private express boats like that of Winwa So have been operating alongside the government ferries. Passengers can board the boat anytime and anywhere, including in the middle of the river. Win Marceau originally wanted to become a biologist. Now, however, she supports a large family as a ship owner. <laughs> The boat stops at all larger villages. In northern Myanmar, where there are virtually no roads, these boats are the only link to the outside world. Win So never stops anywhere very long. After all, she does run an express boat. <laughs> In the winter, the mornings can sometimes be extremely cold, and within minutes, a thick fog can roll in. The greatest danger at times like this is that of accidentally leaving the channel and hitting a sandbank. But just as quickly as the fog rolls in, it rolls back out. Up ahead, the temple town of Tichang comes into sight. Immediately, the first food sellers appear alongside the express boat. All boats traveling the river stop at Tichyang for lunch. The entire city lives by providing passengers with food. The women of Tichyang are in constant competition to see who can conjure up the best dish from the wok. The large government ferries are also boarded by the cooking women before they have even properly docked. Passengers can choose from the full spectrum of Burmese cuisine in which the influences of India, China and Thailand merge. The Ayawadi, Myanmar's great river, is unspoiled and ecologically intact. It provides fish in abundance and irrigates the rice fields. Mm. 
to some extent, the people here live a very archaic life. A life without roads or electricity. In the village of Mitanji, he lives with his extended family. He has seven children, all married. Four generations, a total of 28 people, share one house. Wu Tintang is 58 years old and a fisherman. Like everyone in the village, he has a very special way of fishing, with very special helpers. ตัวเรียนน้ำโมบอมอยู่ของอะไรเจ้าตีบีดามีชาบอมว่าเบี้ยวเดียวมันเลยเจ้าตัวเรียนตีบีดามีชาบอมว่าเบี้ยวเดีย
Bamboo is one of the most important goods transported on the river. Families cut it or buy it in the north of Myanmar and float it downriver to the city of Mandalay. Or even further downstream. On this raft travel three families, complete with child, hearth and home. They've already been on the river for an entire week. ကျုံးမွယ်တာအိုက်ဆိုဆိုဝါဝါလဲကျုံးမွယ်လွန်မျိုးတွေကွဲပြဲပြီးတော့လေအဲ့လိုတစားသည်ဖြစ်ပြီ
but here too, Buddhism is omnipresent. Early in the morning, nuns walk through the streets. The inhabitants view it as a matter of course to give the nuns their daily rice. Including in the gold-beating district. The hammer weighs seven pounds. The job is bad for the back, but good for the karma, because San San Shui and her craftsmen work for the pagodas. Buckskin protects the fine bamboo paper sheets between which the little gold nuggets lie. A coconut shell helps keep count of the number of hammer blows. It takes three minutes for the shell to fill with water, which corresponds to 120 blows. San San Shui is 30 years old and has been in the gold leaf business for the past 10 years. Her four brothers beat the gold. The sisters mount it on paper and prepare the small bundles for sale. Her small business, which she runs, doesn't leave her any free time. <laughs> ดาเนี่ยคุณเซฟไปใส่ยาเนี่ยแล้วตรงนี้รู้ยาเลยรู้เฉยหมดเนาะอันหน้าป่ะตรงแล้วคุณสวยตรงนี้ตรงนี้
It is the fifth anniversary of her father's death, and San San Shui has invited the monks of the nearby temple to conduct a ceremony. The ceremonial pouring of water symbolizes the letting go of everything material. The hospitality shown to the monks after the ceremony is also part of Buddhist tradition. Finally, the distribution of small sums of money to relatives and neighbors is deeply Buddhist too. The recipients help the givers achieve religious merit. And in the end, there is reason for everyone involved to rejoice. Mandalay is the main transshipment point of central Myanmar. And now, as then, many goods of trade arrive and leave via the Ayawadi. The large bamboo rafts all moor in a specific area of the river port. And while tying the raft together is painstaking work, the dismantling goes quickly. Bamboo is widely used in Myanmar. Light, very strong and elastic, it has been used since time immemorial as a building material. The bamboo is processed before it even leaves the port area. Among other things, bamboo mats and hut walls are woven. At the bustling riverfront port, Monk Owen is renting a small ferry boat for the next day. Nowhere else in Myanmar are as many monks and Buddhist monasteries found as in Mandalay. Many monasteries have schools attached. The Fang Dao U monastic school is known throughout the country. An extremely popular teacher is Chao Dui, whom everyone calls Monk Owen. Orphans, children of poor families, and monastic novices receive primary, middle, and higher education here. The school is free of charge. The young monk is also in demand among the other teachers because he is well versed in using the internet. He even has a blog of his own in which he comments on the rapid changes happening in Myanmar. We have contacts with the world, you know, we can read news from the internet, for example. So it is a very good, we, ha we can think, you know, further than the class of Rome. We are going to school to learn a critical thing, to think ourselves, to lead ourselves. Uh, not uh, uh, during what the people say or what the people say. Unayaka is the abbot of the monastery and the headmaster of the school. Some call him the Dalai Lama of Myanmar. His principles are completely different than those of the state schools. In Myanmar, normally they are learning by heart. That is no good in their life. They are afraid of this teacher. They can have no thinking. That's why the Buddhas uh, like the critical thinking. That is Buddha's way. We, that's why also we like the Buddha thinking. Buddhas never like the fear. We respect that it should be with the 
and loving kindness. That is good. That is the Buddha's way. Monk Owen teaches English, a language that is becoming increasingly important in the daily life of the children. Still, they like the excursions with the young teacher much more than they do English grammar. It is only 20 kilometers from Mandalay to the hills of Sagaing. Buddhist monasteries, temples and pagodas shine and shimmer all along the Ayawadi, but nowhere are there as many as in Sagaing. For some of the children, this is their first visit here. They learn that Sagaing is only one of many historical places that lie on the shores of Myanmar's Great River. There are more further downstream the Ayawadi, places like Bagan or the metropolis of Yangon. After nearly 50 years of military rule and isolation, Myanmar, formerly known as Burma, is a land where time has almost stood still. Since 2011, however, the country has begun to open up and introduce reforms. It is changing rapidly. Between the Indian subcontinent and Southeast Asia lies the country of Myanmar. Its life and character has been shaped by the Ayawadi River. Over 2,000 kilometers long, it is the central transport route and connects the historic locations. North of the former royal city of Mandalay lies the village of Chao Miao. Ceramic pots are traded here every day. The village is famous throughout Myanmar for its glazed pottery. Tin Tin Tan heads one of the oldest firing kilns in the village. Earthenware keeps food and water fresh, even in the tropical heat. Pottery making came to Tin Tin Tan's village by way of the Ayawadi.
The big jugs can hold up to 400 litres of drinking water. Pottery from Chao Miao can be found in every household in Myanmar. It takes a whole day to load the huge kiln. After seven days of firing, the pottery is ready for transportation. She oversees the loading of the fragile goods herself. Ma Pa Lang, 33 years old, is a ceramics dealer. Ma the boss, has bought newspapers for her employees. Since the opening of the country, there are dozens to choose from. Sales are arranged by mobile phones, which have only recently become available in Myanmar. Her family sells the ceramics nationwide. <laughs> It takes a day to reach the city of Mandalay. Here, Ma Pa has five tons of pottery transferred onto the Mia AR, a floating supermarket on the Ayawadi, which will take her goods to the south of the country. The Mia AR, the last floating supermarket boat of its kind, consists of two steel barges secured to a nearly 100-year-old ferry. And Wu Tang Shui is her captain. <laughs> Breakfast is prepared at five o'clock in the morning and the women make themselves nice for the day. Pottery trader Ma Pa grinds the bark of a tanaka tree to form a paste. 
Like all women in Myanmar, Ma Pa makes her own Tanaka cream fresh every morning. It is the largest boat on the Ayawadi, with 50 shops spread across two floors. For the next two months, the vendors will live on board. Many of them know each other well, as they've been selling together on the market boat for 20 years. Around noon, the Mia Ea passes Bagan, an ancient city of temples. From the east bank of the Ayawadi, Bagan extends across 36 square kilometers. Over 2,000 religious structures are found here. As of the 11th century, Bagan was the capital of the First Kingdom of Burma. It flourished for 250 years. The pagodas, stupas and temples were sponsored by the rulers of Burma to accumulate good karma for their next life. Many of the religious structures were once richly decorated with stucco, little of which has been spared by the monsoon. What still remains, however, is the magnificent brick architecture. Even today, the fields between the pagodas are still used for agriculture. Sesame is the main crop here, followed by soybean. And Min U has a lot of soybeans. Every day, Two and a half tons of soybeans are washed and, in many pots, on many fires, slowly boiled down in water to create a pasty mass. Min U's soybean paste is considered the best in the country.
Once the paste has the right consistency, it is prepared for packaging. <laughs> Mr. Wu produces and sells a ton of soybean paste every day, only in Bagan. He wants to expand. The pagodas, or stupas, their peaks reaching towards the skies, are tombs and often contain relics. They are monolithic brick structures without any interior rooms. The temples, however, can be entered and always contain four statues of the Buddha. The gestures of the hands symbolize peace, blessing, or protection. Bagan is one of the largest archaeological sites in Southeast Asia. Bagan is also famous for a handicraft made from a material delivered via the river. In the villages near the river, the bamboo is processed. The Bagan craftsmen use only young bamboo and sap cultivated from varnish trees. Hansor Min is one such craftsman. Asian lacquerware has a tradition going back 3,000 years and originally came from China. The lacquer is a natural varnish made from the sap of the indigenous lacquer tree. When heated, it becomes liquid, and then it is applied to the raw bamboo bowls. Fine lacquer bowls take weeks to make. As of recent, Hansor Min has also begun producing cheap goods. The word has spread regarding the beauty of Bagan. The Shui Sandor Pagoda is known to the tourists only as the Sunset Pagoda. 
At sunset, it offers the best views across the Iowadi River. Ceramics dealer Ma Pa has sold well, but the most interesting stops are still to come. She's had a booth on the Mir AR for many years now. The captain, crew and other traders are like family to her. And in terms of business, being on the market boat is definitely worthwhile. When the boat approaches a village, the market boat song is played. The song is familiar to all villagers living at the river. Many villages on the Iowadi lack road access and are far away from any town. The Mir Eyal, the floating supermarket, has everything they can't get in their village. The busiest stands are those of the Tanaka vendors. There are five of them on board. Eight hundred meters into the sky towers a rock formation. It was formed when the now extinct volcano Popa erupted. It is the most important pilgrimage site of those Burmese who, alongside Buddha, also revere spirits known as gnats. Gnats are inseparable from the daily life of Myanmar. There are thousands of gnats but 37 are considered great gnats, and Mount Popa is their headquarters. 
Veneration is paid to nature and household spirits and to spirits responsible for a specific region, town or even profession. The Iowadi River flows untamed and completely natural. And the shallows wander. The water depth has to be continually fathomed. A minimum of three feet of water beneath the keel is always required. Captain Wu Tang Shui has never run his ship aground. The gnat of the boatmen appears to be with him. Those who seek the favor of the river spirit or want protection from evil spirits come to Mrs. Mapan. The summoning of gnats is women's work by tradition, but it is said that transsexuals also have good access to the spirits. Surrounded by rice fields, the village of Tonbo. It has a small market, like so many villages along the Great River. The belief in gnats is particularly deep-rooted in the countryside. A gnat ceremony can last all night. Mediums like Mapan put themselves into a trance. Cigarettes and whiskey are gifts for the gnats. Many Burmese are certain that angry gnats cause terrible hardship when they are not appeased. That is why spirit conjuring is highly regarded in Myanmar. in a traditional style, entirely of teakwood and with deluxe cabins and the best cuisine. As of recent, ships like this have also begun to travel the Ayawadi. Since the opening of the country, tourism has been increasing rapidly, up to 20% annually and more and more tourists, currently about 14,000 a year, treat themselves to a cruise on Myanmar's Great River. It isn't cheap, 
But it is relaxing to watch the everyday life of Myanmar, including the depletion of the forests, glide slowly by. Halfway between Mandalay and the mouth of the Ayawadi, hundreds of Buddha statues have been hewn into the rock. Gautama Hill is a narrow point on the river's lower reaches, and Captain Utang Shui is always happy once his cumbersome market boat has successfully navigated this dangerous spot. The market boat is run by the government, which nowadays invests primarily in road construction. There used to be five market boats on the river. Nowadays, only the Mir Ar remains. And it earns less than its operating costs. This worries Mrs. Kiki Tan, the jewellery dealer. Of course, Kiki Tan also knows of the government's plan to allow China to build a large dam on the upper Ayawadi. Six hundred kilometers south of Mandalay, the Twanti Canal branches off. It connects the Ayawadi to Yangon, the largest city in the country. Captain Utang Shui lives in Yangon. He has been away for 55 days now, but the journey is coming to an end. Once the ship is moored, the last wares are unloaded. The ceramics dealer Ma Pa has already sold the last of her pots and bowls over the phone. She was traveling for two months, and the tour was a success. Captain Wu Tang Shui is looking forward to getting home. In two weeks, he'll be going back up the Ayawadi again. The historic town center of Yangon lies alongside the river. Downtown Yangon was planned and built under British colonial rule. Today, five million people live in Yangon. Yangon has started to change at high speed since the economic and financial sanctions were lifted and investors began pouring in. She was born in Yangon, raised here and studied here. Cho Kailya, called Claire, is 36 years old. She is an architect and is committed to preserving the historic buildings of Yangon. 
Nowhere in the world are there as many British colonial buildings found in such concentration as in Yangon. Most of them are still in use. As offices, hospitals, schools, they are part of the everyday life of the city and part of the history of Myanmar. But many of these historic buildings are endangered and not just by decay. It is a big pressure because the country is um, developing faster. So all those buildings situated in the city are um, heritage buildings. So everyone is looking at the building um, to tear it down and build a new development. So the process has started that the government disposed the building to a private investor. So if we don't have uh, any guideline in the way they renovate the building, we're gonna lose all the heritage and the character of the building. So we feel that it is urgent for us to protect the building before it is too late. The masterpiece of British colonial architecture in Yangon is the so-called Secretariat. It covers an entire city block. From here, the British ruled their colony of Burma. In the courtyard, the country declared its independence. Since the government moved to the new capital, the huge complex has stood empty. The plants will grow on the wall. Um, if you leave them like that, it will break all the brick walls and um, the roof structure as well. Um, if we um, do not repair the broken parts, all the rainwater will fall in and break everything inside. It will be deteriorating in the very uh, near future. Claire and her colleagues are documenting the condition of the building. Together with other architects, Claire has founded an organization to advise the government, which is completely inexperienced in the area of historical preservation. That investors buy the building and tear it down to build banks and offices is an alternative that Claire refuses to accept. This building can be anything. Offices, schools, you know, um, museum, anything, apartment, hotel. But Yangon people do not really want to have a hotel. People always expect to have a museum or art gallery where all the public can assess. But this building is huge, so this is the most challenging issue to get the um, sufficient income to maintain the building. Yangon is changing at top speed. Since the sanctions were lifted, even the newest of tablets can be had. These young monks are interested in getting one. Their protests contributed greatly to Myanmar's opening and reforms. Well, we can use internet very good. We can also uh, read the news uh, what is happening outside of uh, Myanmar. Because uh, also to go outside of Myanmar is also difficult for us. The young monks are well networked and they are also determined to keep a watchful and critical eye on the democratization of Myanmar. Oh, the records are very important. Uh, for example, also we do a lot of social work and projects. So we must have record all, oh, yeah. Without record, uh, whatever happened, or we have a problem. Without record, we can prove. Without record, we cannot prove. So records are also very important. Chao Dui, whom everyone calls Monk Owen, teaches at a monastery-run school in Mandalay. He has come to visit in Yangon. Wherever Owen is, he's always blogging. Among other topics, Myanmar's unpopular neighbor China 
and China's plan to build a large dam on the upper reaches of the Irrawaddy. China is a big danger, you know. They take whatever they can get from Myanmar. So they plan also they plan hydropower project in Upper Burma. And the plan was not working well because of the people, you know, they demonstrate. For 100 villages, they had to move. They are not paid. They just have to move by the government law. It is not fair. The most prominent landmark of Yangon. The Shvedagon Pagoda, one of the most important stupas in the world. It probably dates back well over 2,500 years and was already standing during the lifetime of Buddha. For all Buddhists, a very special place. To sweep at the Shvedagon Pagoda is regarded as a good deed. The teachings of Theravada Buddhism have literally shaped the country. A place of worship and meditation. It is the religious center of Myanmar and one of the most famous pagodas ever. Buddhists from around the world come here. After he returns to Mandalay, monk Owen will tell his students all about the Shvedagon Pagoda. In a less shiny neighborhood, a Burmese art is practiced, which is considered to be the oldest in the country. But has, nevertheless, almost disappeared. <laughs> Rehearsals are held in the living room of King Mang Tui. He is the director of the small troupe of puppeteers. When we're making a puppet, we have to make sculpture, also painting face, and then for the costume, there is embroidery and tapestry. And also, when we are performing, there is music supporting and also narrating vocalists and songs, dance. So most of the performing arts in Myanmar are included in puppetry. The The interest in this ancient art form of Myanmar is almost dead. The puppet theatre, with its religious and moral content, stories from the time of the kings, and performances that often last up to ten hours, is a relic of the past. Mr. Tui would like to change that. There is two Baguda festival for who nice performance, no other place, just for the tourists. But uh, we need to upgrade the puppetry, like modern music and uh, modern character, so developing uh, modern story. So I think the public will be interested in it again.
early in the morning, express boats like this one go from Yangon to the towns of the Irrawaddy Delta. On board the puppeteer troop. They have a long journey ahead of them to one of the most important pagoda festivals in the country. Two hundred kilometers before the mouth of the Irrawaddy, Myanmar's Great River branches out into five rivers and an extremely expansive delta area. With countless rivers and a network of small and even tiny channels, it is a world of water. The bulk of the rice that feeds the country and that also makes up 40% of the nation's export earnings is grown here in the fertile delta region of the Irrawaddy. Then the vegetation changes. Near the ocean, the water is too salty for rice. The only things that thrive here are nipper palms and mangroves. This is where the Irrawaddy saltwater crocodile lives, which can grow up to four meters in length. The people are afraid of the crocodiles, but the only place where nipper palm leaves can be harvested is close to the riverbanks. The nipper palm thrives only in an ecologically intact mangrove forest. The villages near the ocean are poor. And on top of that, in 2008, they were devastated by one of the world's worst natural disasters, the tropical cyclone named Nargis. The world has almost forgotten about it, but here in the Irrawaddy Delta, the memory of the storm still weighs heavily upon the people. The only way to earn any money here is to make nipper mats. ไม่เคลียร์ที่อ่ะกูโทรมาส่งอินเตอร์นิวเกียร์ต้องอะไรจ้ะการเรียนเราเปลี่ยนต้องมาส่งหน่อยไอ้มือเอ๋อกายเอง
whole villages flattened. May Myanmar's great river always be the friend of the people. May it always flow clean, naturally and without dams. In the last light of day, the river spirit Ushinji is offered the tributary gifts. Mr. Tui and his puppeteers are on the way to a performance. The new piece is about a captain and his wife, and about love, separation, and everyday worries that everyone knows. Sweet Home, that's the name of the piece, is intended to bring Myanmar's almost forgotten art of puppetry into the modern era. The puppeteers have arrived at their destination, the Mountain Pagoda, located where the longest arm of the Irrawaddy Delta flows into the ocean. The last golden pagoda of the Irrawaddy. Here, where the great river ends, a great pagoda festival is held once a year. A noisy fair to which many people come to have fun. Other people, those who live on and from the river, are more serious and make offerings to ensure safe passage on Myanmar's great river. Now that the country has opened to the world, the daily life of the people is changing rapidly and dramatically. But at places like the Mountain Pagoda, the Burma of yesterday still lives on. Even if the puppeteers are working on new pieces about the new life in Myanmar, about AIDS, environmental issues and democratic reform, here at the Pagoda Festival they perform the classics. <laughs> <laughs> 